Father, we thank you for this uh, another opportunity today, God, that we can come into your presence and we can praise and worship you. I pray that we can set aside everything else that may be on our minds tonight. God, just for the next few minutes that we can focus on you, give you the best of our praise and worship. Lord, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. We just pray that you'll show up tonight, speak to our hearts. We'll let your word come alive. Let it be something that we can understand and put into practice in our lives. We'll just give you praise for all that's accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
freedom there is in knowing you, Jesus. You didn't save us to leave us right where we were at, God. You saved us to change us and to make our lives better, to give us life and life more abundantly. And God, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you for that tonight. Hallelujah. Let us never forget the power that's in your name. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.
verses 1 through 3 of chapter 1, which dealt with the word of the Lord to Jonah. You remember that? That's how the book opens up. The word of the Lord to Jonah. I believe there's a word of the Lord, and insert your name. There's a word of the Lord to Eric tonight. He wants to speak to me if I'm in relationship with God. There's a word of the Lord to Glenda. There's a word of the Lord to Monica. There's a word of the Lord to each one of us if we're being still enough to listen for His voice. Amen. That still small voice speaking to us. And we can see in verses 1 through 3 Jonah's response to the word of the Lord. And it wasn't what it ought to have been. Right? And so he ends up in a difficult situation. We discussed the manner in which God speaks to His people today, both in Old Testament times and then today. He speaks to His people through visions, right? Through dreams, through His prophets, other preachers. Of course, by the Word of God, the Bible, God speaks to us. That's why we ought to, not out of law or some kind of regimen, but out of a love for God, we ought to open up our Bibles more than just when the pastor serving it to us on a silver platter on Sunday, we ought to firsthand say, God, I want to hear something from you today. God, even if it's just a couple of verses before you go to work, God, I need to hear you speak to me through your word. And we ought to have a regular time where we're in the word of God. And then one of the new ways that God speaks to us in the New Testament times that he didn't speak in the Old Testament times was after the day of Pentecost, the gifts of the Spirit became in operation tongues and interpretation of tongues, prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. And so God can speak to us through the Holy Spirit and through the gifts of the Spirit. We took a look at Jonah's response to the Word of the Lord, how, it, how important it is that we respond correctly to God's Word. And how does that look? It should just be simple faith and simple, belief, simple, simple obedience, right? God, I believe you, and so I'm going to do what you say, right? Right? Mom, when you see that little kid who's three or four years old playing out in the front yard and you see a car coming down the road and they kick the soccer ball out in the road and you see the car but your little three or four year old kid doesn't see the car, they just see what? The ball. And they're going for the ball. And that boy starts running after the ball and you see the car coming. What's the first thing you do, Mom? You just call the kid's name, right? Tanya, Brianna. And because that boy knows his mom's voice, he just freezes, hopefully, right? <laughs> and sometimes God's just calling us, and he doesn't want us to question why he's calling us. He just wants us to simply believe that he has what's best for us in store, and then obey him. Amen? Even if it's not what we would have chosen, when God speaks to us, he wants us to respond in simple faith and simple ob obedience. We talked about that in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 1, God's still telling His people in 2018 the same thing He told Jonah. Arise and go. Don't fill up a bunch of pews and be pew potatoes in a church. But go into your community. Arise and go. Tell broken, hurting, desperate people that Jesus can make a difference in their life. And that's all He was wanting Jonah to do is get up and go to Nineveh. And there was people that he had already been working on. Isn't that good news? When you go to your job, there's people God's already been working on by, your, by His Holy Spirit. And so when you begin to speak to them, they've already had God dealing with their heart. And so God gets the glory, amen? If they get saved, if they turn to Him. But that's what had happened with Jonah. God saying, arise and go. We looked at verses 4 through 10, which dealt with God sending a storm to warn Jonah. Sometimes God doesn't always cause the storm. Sometimes He does. Sometimes God allows storms in our life. What for? To refine our faith, right? To teach us to depend upon Him and Him alone. And God caused this storm in Jonah's life. We learned that God uses the storms of life, adversities or difficulties sometimes to get us back on track. When we're stubborn and we're supposed to be a believer in God, but yet we're going our own way, we're being, as God called many of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, stiff-necked, stubborn, bullheaded, we would say today, right? God sometimes has to use a storm to push us back where we need to be and to point us in the right direction again. And we talked about that. We talked about how when a believer is obeying the voice of the Lord, they can be a tremendous blessing to others around them. That's what God's plan was for Jonah's life. But also, when a believer is stubborn, rebellious, and resisting the voice of the Lord, that same believer can end up being a curse or a hindrance to people around them. As Jonah, as he's sitting in this boat, and these poor fishermen that had nothing to do with what was going on in Jonah's life, they're caught in this storm 
that God is using to get Jonah back on track. And they just got caught in the crossfire, so to speak. And so we need to think about how our lives are impacting the lost around us. We saw from these verses that uh, now is not a time for the church to be fast asleep. Here, these uh, fishermen were cutting themselves and doing their incantations and crying out to their gods. There are many gods that they worship. And what's Jonah doing? He's sleeping in the bottom of the boat. And the boat's about to sink. <laughs> and they go wake him up and say, Jonah, we don't know who your God is, but you need to get up and be praying to your God just like we're praying to all our gods, right? And too much of the modern church is asleep instead of reaching out to a community that desperately needs to know who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. 1 Peter 3.15 says we need to be ready always to get an answer of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear because we were once where the lost people are today, right? We shouldn't be looking down on them. We should be realizing I was there once. I want to help them up to where Jesus can make a difference in their life. And so we need to do that. Then last week we looked at um, verses 11 through 14 and uh, about the mariners looking, the sailors looking for a remedy from Jonah and how the lost world around us, whether we know it or not, they're looking at our lives. They're observing how we act, our attitudes, the things that we say. And they're looking for a remedy today from their sin, their anguish, their brokenness, People are watching your life. If they know you're a Christian, your neighbors see you get up every Sunday and go to church, they're observing your life. And is your life any different than theirs, right? Sometimes the unbelievers know more how we ought to live than believers do, right? You accidentally say a cuss word at work, and it's the unbelievers say, oh, you're supposed to be a Christian. Let, look what you just said, right? They're not living the life to please God, but they know how a, a righteous life ought to look. And so we've got to be very careful, don't we? Uh, how we represent Jesus and uh, the lost world around us. They're looking for a remedy and they're looking in so many wrong directions, so many counterfeits that will never, never satisfy. And we talked about that last week. It's so crucial that we become ministers of reconciliation, reconciling people back into harmony with God instead of being enemies of God. That they can see that God loves them and that He wants a relationship. Ministers of reconciliation, proclaiming the message of reconciliation, which is the message of the cross. Jesus didn't go to the cross to drive people away from him. He went to the cross to be the remedy for our sins, which would allow what? For us to be brought near. I think it's the book of Ephesians says that we were once far away, but now we've been brought near. How? By the blood of Jesus, by his great sacrifice. And that's what he wants. He wants people to be close to him. And we need to tell people around us today that they can be set free from their sins just like we are. And uh, we, can, we can be a witness for Christ. We looked at verses 15 through 17 to close out chapter 1. And it dealt with Jonah being thrown overboard into the sea. We learn how God sometimes can even take our biggest mistakes. Have you ever made any? Yeah. <laughs> we all have. Or if, if we say we don't, then we're lying tonight. And that's a big mistake, right? Uh, but God can take our biggest mistakes and He can use them to reach others. These mariners, they throw Jonah overboard and what happens immediately? The sea just goes and it's calm. And they're like experienced sailors. They've seen a lot of storms, but they've never seen one like this before. Never seen one where it just immediately just went calm after Jonah hit the water. So they're like, I don't know who Jonah's God is, but we're going to make some sacrifices to him. And of course the scholars argue whether they got saved or not. I don't know if they got saved. But they sure had a reverence for Jonah's God because they had never seen anything like that. That's what we need people to see in our lives today. Not just what they've seen in every other Christian. But they need to see that our God is powerful. Amen? That he's holy. That he's righteous. Because we're representing him well. Not because we're making a bunch of mistakes like Jonah did. But because we're living for God. And His power can be demonstrated in our lives. We can see the incredible grip of God's grace upon Jonah's life, can't you? He's thrown into the sea, but God's still in control. His grace is still reaching out to Jonah. Jonah is stubborn. He's almost suicidal. Well, just throw me into the sea. I think he, he thought he was going to die. We might as well just throw me into the sea. I'll die and this will all be over with. All he had to do was what instead? Repent. God, forgive me. I, I should have obeyed your voice. But he doesn't yet at the end of chapter 1. 
and God prepares a great fish, a whale, to swallow him up. And uh, that's still God's grace working. We know that all things work together for good for those that love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. And we can see that definitely in Jonah's life. We can look at the map real quick that we've looked at from uh, chapter 1, if you have that there, Zoe. And uh, you can see uh, Jonah was called from the area of Israel, this area here, and he was called to go to Nineveh. Nineveh was a very wicked city. It, was a, it eventually became the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And they did atrocities, killed people, not just in normal ways. They were horrific in their treatment of their enemies. And so Jonah didn't feel like they deserved to hear the good news because he knew they would repent and God would have mercy on them. And Jonah didn't want that because of the atrocities and the wickedness that had followed Nineveh, their reputation. And so instead of going to Nineveh from Israel, which would be a long journey this way, he goes to Tarsus and tries to go in the opposite direction, away from where God wants him to be. Never a good idea to run in the opposite direction of where God's wanting you to go. And that's so many lessons we can learn about that if we'll just humbly submit. And what is it? I think it's Ephesians 2.13. He'll give us both the will and the desire to do His perfect will. The will and the ability to do what He's called us to do. And if we'll just trust Him, maybe it's beyond us what He's asking us to do. Maybe it was beyond Jonah and his strength and his ability to go to Nineveh. He didn't feel adequate to do that job. But he could have asked the Lord for help. And man, we ought to learn uh, the right response and the wrong response to when God speaks to us. Let's look at Jonah chapter 2. I want us just to read the chapter. It's just 10 verses. And then we're going to jump into uh, what some of these verses are talking about in chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2. Starting with verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet you have brought, me, brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in, in unto you, into your holy temple. They who observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. All right, and I want us to look at, there's really two paragraphs or two sections in this chapter. And the first one is verses 1 through 9, and it's Jonah's prayer of repentance, right? Jonah's prayer of repentance. Of repentance, And it's about time, right? <laughs> it's about time that Jonah decided he's going to repent because his life just about got snuffed out by being thrown into the sea. And, uh, and his little pity party that he was having was not really solving the problem. What he needed to do was repent. And once he's inside the belly of this fish and he realizes this is God's grace, this might be my last chance. I'm either going to be digested or God's going to work and save my life in this situation, right? And so he finally prays a prayer of repentance. And so from the dark, smelly, terrifying fish's belly, can you imagine that? How awful that would smell and how awful that would be? Jonah finally calls out to God in true repentance. Why is it sometimes that we have to hit rock bottom and come to the complete end of ourselves before we repent and we turn to God? Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry that I got caught, right? We've all tried that little game with God. It's not, I'm sorry I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar. It's, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you, and I don't want to keep doing that. It's a 180-degree turn. God, I was running this way towards that sin, and you were back here. And God, you convicted me. You told me I needed to change. And so I did a 180 degree turn. And now my sin is behind me and I'm running to you. That's true repentance. That's what the word literally means. It's a U-turn. It's a turning around 
uh, away from sin and running back into the arms of God. And that's what Jonah finally does. And if you've been running from God or you've been disobeying the call upon your life, all he wants is not you to figure it all out, not for you to have a five-year plan and a ten-year plan, right? He wants you just to trust him. Simple faith. Simple obedience, just run back into his arms. Know that he can fix the, the things that you've messed up and he can make it right. And Jonah had to do that. He had to decide to repent and to turn back to God. Jonah quotes an accumulation of, a mul of multiple psalms in his prayer in the whale's, whale's belly. What does this tell us? Number one, Jonah knew the word of God. It's a good thing to hide God's word in your heart so that when you're in a difficult time, you have that to draw upon, amen? You have a Holy Spirit reminding you, the Spirit of truth, reminding you of truth. Instead of all the lies that you've been stubborn and rebellious to keep believing, the Holy Spirit begins to draw upon the Word of God. And that's what was happening to Jonah in this whale's belly. I believe the Holy Spirit, don't you, began to refresh his memory of these psalms that he had studied as a young man, maybe even before he had been called into full-time ministry as a prophet. And he began to remember God's word. Isaiah 55, 1, 55, 11, I'm sorry, says this. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word. He's going to fulfill his word if we'll believe it and we'll pattern our lives according to the scriptures. Number two, Jonah still had faith in God. To redeem him. You can see that in Jonah's prayer of repentance, can't you? He still, it may not have been big faith, but Jesus said, how big does your faith have to be to move mountains? Mustard seed faith. Just a little faith. If it's got the right object, Jesus, powerful things can happen. And Jonah still believed that God could redeem him. Number three, Jonah recognized that he was in sin. So many people today, they won't own their sin. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always my dad or my grandfather or my environment or somebody else's problems. That's why I'm the way I am. And Jonah had to own up to his sins. We're going to have to own up to our sins if we're going to find a remedy for them. Amen? In James 4, 17, it says, Therefore to him that knows to do good, it was a good work to go to Nineveh, right? To give them the word of the Lord, to give them a chance to repent. Even though Jonah didn't want to do it, he knew the good that he ought to have done. It says, therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So sin's not always what you do. Sometimes it's not doing the good that you should have done, right? Does that make sense? And so we need to learn from Jonah's example. Own our sin. God, forgive me. When we miss that opportunity to witness to that coworker or that neighbor, and the Holy Spirit saying, now, I want you to share the scripture. I want you to go and help that person or pray with them. And we just, ah, I'm not sure, God. We, we, we put it to the side or in stubbornness, we say, I don't want to do that. It's, not, it's out of my comfort zone, right? When we realize that we missed an opportunity, what should we do? God, forgive me. That person needs the Lord, right? Just like I did when I first got saved. They need the Lord. And God, help me not to miss those opportunities again. And God will help us. It's never too late to pray. Isn't that what we can learn from Jonah's prayer of repentance? It's never too late to pray. He's in a fish's belly, and he decides, okay, it's time to pray. <laughs> I don't know where you're at tonight, but it's never too late to pray. Your situation is not hopeless if you still have breath in you to pray and ask for the Lord's help. Prayer is the most powerful force in which the child of God can engage. However, there are particulars that go along with prayer that must be heeded before results can be expected. Some of them are as follows. Number one, the cross of Christ, God's redemption plan, the blood of Jesus, the message of reconciliation, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same. But we, it, it alone is the means by which we receive all that we need for life and godliness. Second Peter 1.3 it's the cross. What Jesus did at the cross, when he said, it is finished, he meant everything you need for life and godliness. He provided it. So he gets the glory. Amen? It's not your hard work. It's not some religious effort that you went through that caused the good things to happen. It's what Jesus did at the cross. And your simple belief, your simple faith in that gives you the answers to prayer that you're seeking. 
Amen? We can cry out to our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus did at the cross. And we better remember that when we pray. We better remember the will of God. Number two, it is fruitless to pray if one does not want to carry out the will of God for one's life. Why pray? Well, God, I want you to... I want you wrecked my neighbor's car because he looked at me funny yesterday and I'm upset. God doesn't answer prayers like that. All of us have been tempted at least to pray some of those prayers, right? That person who cuts them off in traffic, oh, I pray they get a ticket, right? Maybe they need one. <laughs> but God doesn't always answer those prayers. He answers the prayers that are according to His will, what He wants and what He desires. Number three, ongoing sin. If there's ongoing sin in one's life, and he does not want to give it up, he will have no desire to pray because the very moment one begins to petition the Lord, the sin is going to stare him in the face no matter what the sin is. Amen. We've got to deal with sin before we come to the Lord in prayer. The Word of God. Our prayers should be biblical prayers using the promises God gives us in the pages of Scripture. And if we pray, as I said earlier, about 714 prayer, when we pray the Word of God, we're praying the will of God. And that's why it's important that we use scriptures in our prayer time. Unbelief. Many Christians simply do not pray because they do not believe God. They believe that they just have to figure some things out. There are some things that God wants us to figure out for ourselves, simple things of life. But there are far too many things that we ought to be asking God's help for that we don't that we're trying to handle in our own strength, that if we would just turn to the Lord in prayer, He would help us. And He would make it to where He doesn't have to res rescue us from the ditch where we wreck the car, right? When we seek Him first, He'll give us direction and the right way to go. When life is going well, we tend to take God for granted, don't we? But when we lose hope, we cry out to Him. This kind of relationship with God can result only in an inconsistent up and down spiritual life. A consistent daily commitment to God promotes a solid relationship with Him. Look to God during both the good and the bad times and you will have a stronger spiritual life. If Jesus is just your crutch when you get into a crisis, it's not a very deep relationship. We need to serve Him at all times. Listen to this quote from Matthew Henry. Sometimes the condition of God's people may be such in this world that they may think themselves excluded from God's presence, so as no more to see Him. But it is only their surmise of unbelief. For God has not cast away His people whom He has chosen. Faith corrected and controlled the surmises of fear and distrust. Here was a fierce struggle between sense and faith, but faith had the last word and came off conquer. Jonah's faith said, yet I will look again towards thy holy temple. Amen. Jonah could have just given up. And he could have just uh, died in that fish's belly, but he said, you know what? I'm going to turn to God one more time. I'm going to pray. It's never too late to pray. Even in Jonah's rebellion and running from the presence of the Lord and in his disobedience to the word of the Lord, Jonah knew that salvation comes from the Lord alone. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation is not just when we get our sins forgiven, and the power and the grip of dominion of sin is broken over our lives, and we're what we call born again, John chapter 3. That's, that is... Um, Salvation, But how many know that once you become a Christian, God's still saving us from ourselves, from our foolish decisions, from our past. It doesn't just instantly, it doesn't all always instantly go away just because you get saved. He's constantly, that word sozo, which salvation comes from, is He's saving us constantly with His amazing grace. He saved us from the penalty of sin and going to hell. We have an eternal home, but He's saving us making us more like Jesus, administering His grace by the Holy Spirit each and every day. Amen? He's saving us. There's not salvation. We don't get saved, born again, and then we figure it all out ourselves, right? He's constantly still saving us 40 years after we get saved. Amen? That's true for me. I got saved when I was five. I'm 46 years old. There's still time when God's rescuing me. He's helping me. He's giving me wisdom. He's giving me peace. He's healed my body. He's brought breakthroughs in prayer. And you better realize salvation comes from the Lord. And that's not going to come from other people. 
Vain is the help of man, Psalm says. But when God helps us, uh, we know that we're saved. And so Jonah realizes all of these things in his prayer of repentance. Number two, the God who saves responds to Jonah. We can see that in the final verse of chapter 2, verse 10. The Lord spoke, a, spoke unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. I don't know which is worse, to be swallowed into a whale's belly and still be alive, or to be vomited out of a whale's belly onto dry land. Either one is disgusting, right? <laughs> but he's alive. He's alive. And sometimes God, again, uses difficult things, but his, his, the grip of His grace is upon us through even some of the most horrific times in our life. And we ought to recognize, you know, God preserved my life. How many people could have said, like Jonah, I was in a whale's belly and I was alive. And I'm still alive now. This whale spit me out. I'm sure that was a, a story he told his friends and they're like, probably couldn't even believe it, right? That's definitely not just one for the grandkids. That's one for everybody you know. And that's the grip of God's grace upon Jonah's life. When proper faith is expressed in who Jesus is, what Jesus has done on the cross, and that a genuine prayer of repentance is offered up, God can save a person to the uttermost. Amen? Do you believe that? He can save a person to the uttermost. How in the world is God going to get Jonah out of this whale's belly? Well, he prepared the fish to swallow him, so he just prepares him to spit him up on the dry ground. None of us would have planned it that way, right? But it brought about a prayer of repentance in Jonah's life and a turn in direction for what God wanted him to do. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. This is an awesome verse. When you're praying for an unsafe loved one, who just seems so far away from the Lord and has so, had so many opportunities to repent and they still don't seem to get it, pray over this verse regarding that person's life. It says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. God is praying for your unsaved loved ones. He is making intercession for for your lost loved ones, and He's able to save them to the uttermost. They're not too far gone, amen? They're not so, so bad off that God can't come and fix what's going on in their lives. And the God who saves responds to Jonah. He saves him to the uttermost. And uh, it's His grip of grace again upon Jonah's life. Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Thus says the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made. And all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man will I look. I think you could say to this woman as well. God says, I will look. Even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Why did God say no? Because that's the kind of repentance he had. He was poor and contrite, broken, recognizing he needed God's help. The only salvation was going to come from him. And we need to stay in that hard attitude each and every day of our lives if we want God's help in our situation. When God delivers you, his deliverance is complete. Amen? Notice the whale vomited Jonah onto dry ground and not back into the sea. Right? It was onto dry ground. God's amazing grace was involved in that. Just like it has been in your life. It's not just coincidence, as unsaved people would tell you. Oh, well, that's just coincidence. No, it was a miracle. It was God's grace that brought you to the place that you are today. And He has a plan. He has a purpose that He's working out in your life, just like He did for, Noah, uh, for Jonah. To whatever the Lord speaks, be it animate or inanimate, it instantly obeys with the exception of man. Why is it that man, that part of God's creation, is the most rebellious? Because <laughs> Lucifer got a hold of us, right? Told us the lie that we could be like God, appealed to our pride. But even in our rebellion, God can forgive us if we'll just repent, if we'll just turn to Him. Jonah's discharge from his imprisonment and his deliverance from death may be considered as an instance of God's mercy to a poor penitent that in his distress prays to God. Amen? He just cries out to God, God, I don't know how this is going to be fixed, but I trust you and I'm looking to you. So let's learn from the prayer of Jonah. All God's looking for when we mess up is just repentance. God, forgive me. I don't want to keep going this way. 
away from you and towards my sin. God, I want to run and put that sin to my back and run back into your arms. Amen. I want your help in my life. I want you to save me not just once when I get born again, but I want you to constantly save me. Save me from my own foolish decisions. Save me from my sicknesses. Save me from my financial problems. Amen. Save me from the family issues, God, that I don't know how to fix. And God will save us. He'll help us. He'll respond to our prayer just like He did to Jonah. And we can believe God for that. Amen. Let's stand tonight. I want us to close in prayer. I don't know the condition of your heart tonight, whether you have a relationship with God. But are you saved? Are you ready for heaven? It's the most important decision you can make. Maybe you're listening to this message on our YouTube channel or podcast at a later date, and you, you'd say, Pastor Eric, I'm not sure I'm ready to meet the Lord. I'm not sure I'm ready to spend eternity in heaven with Him because I've got sin in my life. I've got things that I know are not pleasing to Him. Well, you know what? Jesus is the remedy for your sin. And if you'll pray a prayer very similar to Jonah's, a prayer of repentance, God, I'm sorry, not just that I got caught, but God, I'm sorry that I've not lived the way you said I ought to, and I don't want to keep living that way. God will forgive you. He'll cleanse you and help you to have real life. And I want us to pray this prayer tonight. We call it the sinner's prayer. I'm going to ask those who are here in this room tonight to pray this prayer after me. And if you're listening to this message or even you're here tonight and your life's not right with God or you need to rededicate your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll just pray this prayer in faith, I believe the Lord will respond to you and He'll forgive you. He'll not only take away the stains of your past, the acts of sin that you've committed, but he'll break the grip. The cross was called a double cure. It not only took away the guilty stains that you can't forget. God will forget them if you give them to him and ask for his forgiveness. But he'll also break the grip, the dominion that Romans chapter 6 talks about that sin has over your life. And no longer will you be ruled by your sin. You'll be ruled by Jesus. He'll become your Lord. He'll become your master if you'll ask him in. And so would you pray this prayer after me? And if you need to give your heart to Jesus... Would you pray this prayer in faith and let Him do that work in your heart tonight? Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I come to you in Jesus' name, in Jesus name admitting, and acknowledging that I am a admitting and acknowledging that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus, I believe Jesus that you died on the cross for my sins, paying the penalty that I deserve. And I am in need of you, Jesus, to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Please forgive me for all my sin. Wash me. Make me clean. And help me from this day forward to live for you. Thank you for saving me. Making me ready for heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, give us a call. Send us an email. Let us know. We want to pray with you and help you grow in your walk with the Lord. And uh, find a church where you can get plugged into this preaching Jesus on the cross. And uh, people who, who will believe uh, in the Bible and what it teaches. And uh, grow in your walk with the Lord. Spend some time in His Word. Spend time in prayer each and every day. And uh, it's the best decision you've ever made. The Bible says that heaven rejoices over one lost sinner that repents. And so heaven's rejoicing at your decision tonight. God's happy and He wants to bless you and He wants to help you. I want us as believers to close out tonight and, and with, a, with a song of praise and worship and maybe instead of running towards God in a situation you're saved, you're not lost but maybe there's a situation in your life and instead of running towards God and laying it all at His feet, maybe you've been trying to handle it yourself. Or running in a different direction, kind of like Jonah did. And for whatever reason, you've been running in the wrong direction. God wants to restore your faith that Satan or circumstances have tried to steal from you. You know, when Jesus wants to put a song back in your heart again, He wants to put purpose in your steps. And He wants to put an anticipation of the good things that God has in store for you. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, Eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither is entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for those who will just simply love Him tonight. So can we just take a few moments as we sing this song and just love on Jesus. Say, God, this is what's going on in my life. And each of us may have different circumstances, different situations, but would you just lay those things at His feet and say, God, I need your help. 
Just like Jonah was desperate and he needed you in his situation, God, I need you to save me. I need you to help me. I need the help of your Holy Spirit. And if we'll do that, I believe God's going to help us tonight. Amen. He's going to bring answers. He's going to bring breakthrough. And then we'll, we'll close in a prayer together tonight. Praise the Lord. Make the words of this song your prayer tonight. Hallelujah. Let us be a part of that. 
God, I pray that we'll be bold witnesses for you, that we'll look for divine appointments where we can sow a seed of the gospel in someone's life this week. Give us holy boldness to point people to Jesus, who he is, what you've done for us. God, let us see lives delivered, lives set free as a result. We thank you. Lord, bless us as we leave this place tonight. Give us an incredible week in your presence. God, use us as tools, instruments in your hand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.